All right, we're gonna get started. We're gonna start with some disclaimers. And I have three of them. The first one is that we know we have a weird title and we will explain it later and we're basically wanted to have some fun with it. The second is that some things we talk about may sound familiar, we're aware of that. And the third is that we really like to tell stories, so we're gonna have a lot of stories in here. And I'm gonna address these three disclaimers one by one. First, our title. Brandy recommended the book Blink to me, and that's where the first part of our title comes from, the Blink, is from that book. And in the very first chapter of that book, if you've read it, is a story about a Greek statue. There was a museum that wanted to purchase this beautiful, beautiful representation of this, this Koros. And it was so perfect, they had some fear that it might be fake. So they did this initial data gathering, and through the data gathering, all evidence suggested it was real. So, so they went ahead and started moving forward with making the purchase, and this is a million dollar purchase. And as they were moving forward and kind of celebrating and announcing that they were getting this lovely, lovely artifact, they reached out to some experts. And the experts within minutes of looking at the statue thought, something feels fake. Another expert looked at it and said, something feels new. And I think the word they used was fresh. But both of them had this initial reaction of something just feels wrong to them. And the book Blink is about those expert and informed but immediate uh, decision making that some people make when they have this expertise to be able to understand the problem, that they don't even have to think about it, they don't need data, they just know. And the experts turned out to be right, it was a fake. Their initial intuition was more correct than the initial data. Now more data gathering is what decided that, but they had this intuition that was more effective than the superficial data gathering. The next part of our title is from Doctor Who. Uh, there is my favorite all-time episode where they introduce the Weeping Angels. If you're not a Doctor Who fan, uh, you can just think of these things as evil time-shifting angel statues. So we have this whole statue theme going on. And they're introduced in this episode called Don't Blink. And it's one episode that doesn't actually really feature the Doctor, so it's a really interesting episode. But in it, the main character is trying to avoid keeping her eyes off of all these statues that are in the room. And so our title comes from this idea of, well, you have this idea of blink and how expertise and experience can make you know immediately from limited information that something is true or not true. But then also you have these scenarios where you actually do have to see the full picture, the full situation, in order to really be effective at what you want to happen. And how do you balance the two? So my second disclaimer was that some things may sound familiar. There has been an explosion of interest in bias lately, for a lot of many reasons, the diversity space, but also how it affects how we build our software. And last year there was a great talk on how bias affects usability. And that was really a talk around looking at your users. Our talk is entirely around looking at yourself, about how you are making decisions when you're building that software by your own biases. So we're actually gonna call you out. Lastly, we like to tell stories. I feel like stories really help to illustrate things, that help to ha make things stick when you're learning. So we are gonna tell several stories. And you may wonder like, okay, are these real stories or did they make them up? And I'm gonna tell you that they are all real, but we've changed some details, we've simplified some things, we've made up a few things just to be able to illustrate some things better. And so we're actually gonna start by talking about stories and the impact they have on that. And with that, I'm gonna let uh, Brandy talk some science. <laughs> so one of the things that we know about good stories is they cause our brains to release oxytocin. It's actually a chemical reaction that occurs in your brain. And the release of oxytocin causes you to have different attitudes, make different decisions, and behave differently. And that's not a bad thing. Back to Blink, whenever you are making quick decisions, your brain is optimized to make quick decisions based on a lot of data that you have and you've gathered in the past. So essentially, really good stories help you take a whole bunch of different concepts and put them together really quickly, and you, from there, start to develop a sense of the world around you. You categorize, and that is how this thin slicing thing works. And we found that stories are actually incredibly effective for influencing the behavior that you want to affect. 
Um, part of the reason that charities connect stories to the things that they are trying to raise money for is because people are twice as likely to donate to the charity if there's a compelling story of someone who has been affected by the issue that they're trying to address. And so one of the things that we want to kind of address in this talk is this idea that the most compelling story you have is the story about yourself how you see yourself and who you think you are and the things that you think provide value in the world that you contribute, like these are the skills you have, this is how you approach a problem. And also your knowledge as well about the things that you feel that you are an expert on and how that story to yourself impacts your, de your um, decision making as part of being an engineer or a solution designer or a test analyst. And the reason why understanding that you have your own personal story is very important because it does sometimes make us think illogically about our place in the world. One of the studies I've seen before is the asking the question, how many people think they're a good driver? And so I want you to actually pause for a minute and I want to ask you to think about, do you think you're a good driver? And then I want you to think about how many bad drivers you think are on the streets. And then I want you to think about what that means about the likelihood that you're a good driver because you're not the only good driver in the world, and so probably you're making the same mistakes everyone else is making all the time. And if you're not zipper merging, you are. <laughs> so back to thin slicing and the way that we make sense of our world, we tend to try to organize things into logical categories. So I'm a good driver. Everyone who doesn't zipper merge is a bad driver. People who don't know how to drive slow in the, or in the right lane and fast in the left lane are bad drivers, et cetera. So we organize people this way, and that is OK. The problem is that a lot of times, we fail to try to reorganize when we're presented with new information. So our brains are kind of hardwired to think about things in a given structure, and then we continue to think about them that way regardless of what else happens. So essentially, we all have this story about ourselves, and we really want you to remember that as we go through everything, that we all fall victim to our own stories, and that we all are the protagonist of our own stories, and it's very, very difficult for anyone, yourself, the people you're working with, the people you're talking to, to change their minds about who they are, what they do, what value they bring to the table, and it's possible that you will never convince anyone of that, and so, the easiest thing to do is to be imaginative about the way that you're thinking about all of these situations, and that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time. So we promised you that we'd talk about some biases, so I'm going to start with the continued influence effect, and I'm going to start it with a story again, and it's a story that's very personal to us, which is the story that Brandy and I did not go to school together. So this is kind of a weird, silly story, but it's, it's a fun one for us because we see it keep popping up. There's some sort of weird narrative going on at Cerner that the reason why Brandy and I work together so much or get along so well is we had to go to college together. Now, it may be surprising for you to learn, I am actually six years older than Brandy. So if you map out the times we would have been in school, it is fundamentally impossible for us to ever been to school together. Also, we're both military brats. We were almost never in the same location at the same time. So we never went to school together. Now, the interesting thing is we did actually finally meet at Cerner, because we started Cerner roughly within a year of each other this my second time around. And that's when we met. We worked together on a number of things around learning and engineering, and that's when we built this rapport. Now, this is, seems like a harmless story, like the fact that people believe it's true no matter how much she tells them we didn't go to school together and I tell them we didn't go to school together. And it is relatively harmless. But what it does do is it gives people this narrative around like, well, why do they get along? Well, they get along because they went to school together, rather than appreciating that maybe they get along because we have a shared vocabulary, or we think about problems the same way. Uh, Brandy and I have a shorthand where I can say something to her like the cult of knowing, which we'll talk about later, and she'll know exactly what I mean. And that's really why we work together, not because of any historical relationships. And so that's the continued influence effect, is no matter how much you can logically explain to someone something's not true or provide them evidence, um, they still want to believe it. People still want to believe we went to school together. And uh, I think sometimes we see this play out also in weird sort of technical decisions as well, is everyone in this room who's an engineer should know by now that most compilers can optimize away the difference between post-increment and pre-increment, but you still occasionally see arguments on code reviews. 
So along with the continuous influence effect is the backfire effect. And the oatmeal treated this really well a few weeks ago. So go read the oatmeal if you don't. And if you don't know what the oatmeal is, you should find out because it's very good. So um, essentially, whenever we have decided how we're going to perceive of our world and we've created our categorizations, again, it's really difficult for us to change. And the really interesting thing is sometimes when we are provided with information that actually flies in the face of what we believe, it proves factually that we are incorrect about the way we've thought about the world. It can make us double down on what we believe. And we actually believe those things more strongly than we did before because we feel like we're under attack. It triggers the fight or flight instinct. So from an evolutionary perspective, it's the same reaction in your brain that you would have had if a saber-toothed tiger was chasing you and you're just running away. Someone presents you with new information about something you hold to be true, you are going to kick into this weird protective drive in your brain and double down on something that might actually not be true. I think as engineers, we see this play out in language wars. So I was, when I was working at Garmin, there was an individual that came into my office really, really frustrated because somebody asked him to do something that was not in C++. And he had this story about himself that he was a C++ engineer. He went to college for C++. He applied for jobs solely to do C++. And asking him to do something like Java was offensive to him. And when we tried to discuss why, you know, in this particular case, Java was a better language, or had it been any other language that we could have been arguing about, he just reacted. He was very frustrated. He would not listen to any argument. And I think that in, his, that in that sense, it was the backfire effect for him. He just had believed so strongly that C++ was the right language that he couldn't come out of it. And he should have admitted it was a cow all along. So I think as engineers, we have these core technical beliefs. And sometimes they're hard for us to get away from them, whether it is a favored language or other things. Uh, when I first got out of college, a lot of my professors had been telling me, and a lot of my architects and peers were telling me, that you should never have multiple return statements. Or that, as I mentioned, pre-increment is faster than post-increment. Or do not throw exceptions. And these were things that we had to fight hard to kill, as because there were these core technical beliefs by these engineers and architects that had been in the field for four or five years, when these things actually did help yield better programming. And we still have some of these core technical beliefs. All objects must be immutable. There can be no state. Everything must be rest. These are the things that we're now building as part of our dogma of software engineers now. And some of you might be reacting like, oh gosh, she put these, all these sentences on one slide as if they're all equivalent. And those ones are clearly outdated and wrong. And the ones that are lower are clearly right. So you're seeing this. But the reality is these ones will die too. These ones will become outdated just as much as the other ones. And will we adapt? And will we see it coming? And will we accept it? The problem is that sometimes people get to a point where some belief they have that really isn't that black or white or wrong or right, it gets moralized in their own mind. And what I mean by that is they actually treat it just as you would any other moral idea that they have about right or wrong. And so they see it as like, thou shalt do this or thou shalt not do this, when in reality for most technical decisions, it's really mostly you should. So this moves on into another story around when we're making technical decisions, and we have these core beliefs about how things should and shouldn't be done, and then we have friction trying to work with others that believe differently. And to illustrate that, I'm going to talk about an automation project that I worked with with another engineer. The engineer came to me very, very excited that they had automated something. And this is the workflow that, that they had created in order to automate it. They had some Ruby script, it called a REST API, it created a text file of the results, then a person went in, invoked the Ruby script, passing some parameter, checked the text file and got the text file, checked it into Git, merged that to master. Then a separate person creates a release, deploys the code with Chef, so the text file with Chef, I mean. And then there's Java code that later goes on and finds the text file on the cluster, zips it up, and makes a zip file available for download. And so if I draw out that architecture diagram, you've got this person doing all this, and then this system and another person doing all this, and that's the system that they built. And that triggered my blink reaction, which is something feels 
horribly wrong about this system as they're describing it to me. This is horribly wrong. And in that first minute that I had that reaction, I couldn't explain why. I was completely unable to articulate why this thing was so horribly repulsive to me. And so after I took a breath and thought about it a little bit, I just finally said, I, I don't think that actually meets the definition of automation, that it's manual, and so we need to talk about what you did. And he's like, no, 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 I automated it. I automated it. And my mind is like, okay, if you really automate something, it should be push button or just magic. Like, I shouldn't even be aware it's happening. And so I said, no, it's manual, because you put a person in the middle of your architecture. Like, your person's now a component in your architecture. And what I was really zeroing on is this piece, this piece, because that person, that face in the middle of that architecture is now part of it. They're baked in. And his response was, it's automated because there's a script. I have a script. It's, it's automated. And again, oh my gosh, something just feels wrong. And I was getting this emotional, frustrated response where I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you don't understand this. And what I was really trying to get to, and I failed at communicating, was that this should have been this. It could have been much simpler. And that's what that, that reaction I was having, that blink reaction was. But rather than having this conversation, I focused on an argument over the definition of automation. And so that takes us back to the curse of knowledge. A lot of times we have a lot of underlying knowledge that other people around us don't have. And we don't know that they don't have it. So we're talking with people, and they're with us, and they understand everything that we're saying. And there's someone sitting off to the side going, I have no idea what you're doing or what you're talking about. Or maybe they think they do, but they don't, because they don't have all the underlying context. And one of the really interesting things about this phenomenon is that this is what creates a sense of community with people really frequently. So when we're all watching the same TV shows or we're all reading the same books, we all have this similar vocabulary, this similar foundation that we can operate off of in order to communicate with people. This is why schools make you read all of those books that everyone hates, like <laughs> Lord of the Flies and, I don't know, Moby Dick. I hated Moby Dick. And everyone knows, not everyone, most people know what it means to talk about pursuing the white whale, right? We know that this is Captain Ahab's weird, psychotic obsession with this whale that he's never been able to catch. And so because we know that, we can use that in shorthand with people. So one of the ways to overcome this is to think about it in terms of stages of competence and think about what people know and how they know it. So at the bottom of this pyramid is unconscious incompetence. This is also very similar to the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is essentially when people are too incompetent to know what they don't know. And it's an incredibly frustrating place to be because inevitably you're trying to move someone in a direction and they are adamant that they know what they're doing and what they're talking about, and you know that they don't. And so you have to figure out how to start moving them forward. And so essentially you have to expose to them repeatedly the parts of the system they don't understand or the things that they don't know. And then they reach a point where they are conscious of the fact that they don't know what they're talking about. And that's also really difficult because now you have someone who's kind of unmotivated and doesn't really want to do anything anymore. Then we have people who move into conscious competence where they do know what they're supposed to do, but it's this very laborious process and it takes them forever to get through it. And if you are managing them or working with them, this is painful because you're watching them do it and you want them to go faster, but they just can't. But you should count yourself lucky because they actually know what they don't know and they know more things now. And then the top of this pyramid is the unconscious competence area where you're that expert looking at the Greek statue and you know that something's wrong, but you can't necessarily articulate it. And so knowing that you're at the top of the pyramid and when someone is at the bottom of the pyramid and that you have to close that gap in order to communicate with them is a really important realization for actually coming to some kind of consensus or at least a solid idea about how to address a problem. Now, I said I would talk about the cult of knowing, and the funny thing about the cult of knowing it is this shared vocabulary that Brandy and I had that we thought was actually a thing in the world, that there was this, these, she had learned it from, she thought, her literature and her teacher, and, and I thought, oh, this is this cool thing. And then we went to go search for studies and sources about it, and we couldn't find anything. So we may have made this up, but we're going to share it with you anyway. 
So the idea behind the cult of knowing is that some people feel that knowledge is their value and that knowledge is power. And therefore they create a cult around that knowledge and they don't share it. And so whether or not they realize it or not, they're acting in a way that inhibits the transfer of knowledge by deciding not to blog or not to write something on UCERN or not to forward emails or not to have people in a meeting because their identity is that they're valuable because they know things. And that having other people know those things takes away some of their value. There's a great story about this. I'm actually going to tell a Google story from uh, Jonathan Rosenberg from Google. In the, in the book, How Google Works, he tells the story about how an engineer approaches him and says, uh, I don't understand what you do here. All you seem to do is take emails and forward them to other people, and that's not very valuable. And it was kind of the equivalent of the office space part where somebody says, okay, oh, well, you just take the requirements from the customers and you deliver them to the engineers, so what is your value? What did you do here? And somebody called Jonathan out on that. And keep in mind, he was an executive at Google at this time. And his answer was beautiful. He said, I'm a router of information, not a firewall. My value to this company is making sure that the right information gets to the right people so they can make decisions. And that is tremendously valuable, more than if I was acting as a dictator or the person making all of the decisions. So we're going to beat this to death for a little bit because it actually is really important. Building common context is what allows people to operate as some kind of unit as opposed to a whole bunch of disparate parts. Um, and so it's also the thing that allows us at Cerner to do the thing we call connecting the work. So that's a management competency at Cerner. It's the way that you give people some sort of um, sense of what we're all working towards together. And there's some interesting um, dialogue right now about how we treat people as systems. And they're not necessarily systems. They're actually, or machines. They're more like a school of fish. And they are all independent actors, but they, you see them move consistently as a group in the same direction. And that is an incredibly valuable place to achieve as an organization. And so some people might think that this comes down to leadership. If we just have really good leaders who are articulating really good vision, everything is fine and dandy, and we can all get there. But there's this other concept called followership. And this comes from the leadership nudge people. So that's another thing that you can go look up. They send out weekly emails. They tell you some really interesting thing that you can try with your people. And um, this is their idea. We stole it from them. So leadership is this very top-down idea where we are sending things down the pipe. We expect people to internalize them and move forward with them. And followership is this idea that it's bottom up instead. You have people who are actually following you, they're paying attention to what's happening. But more importantly, as a leader, you have established guiding principles that people can make decisions against and that they can reason about and they can behave autonomously and still as part of the general unit. It's this shared meaning again. Everyone knows what all of the words and the vision mean. Everyone knows what all of the concepts mean and what those behaviors look like in the organization. So shared context, we all have the same information. We know what all of that information means, and we can all act on it. So again, be a router, not a firewall, because your value doesn't come from what you know. It comes from how you behave and what you're able to achieve. So the next bias we're going to talk about is actually my favorite one when it comes to engineers, architects, and people who are makers, who are making things, and that's the IKEA effect. And the IKEA effect is the idea that people like their IKEA furniture better because they actually had to assemble it themselves, and it's called effort justification. So you're trying to basically say, like, because I took the time and effort to do this, it must be better. And so when we look at software or at Cerner, we kind of have two errors. We have the error of what I call the three-letter acronyms. And we built a lot of things that we felt we needed at the time, our own uh, request response framework, our own way of managing um, access control. And now we're in a new era, which I call the era of code names. So again, we're building more platforms. We're building more frameworks. A lot of them are leveraging a lot of open source, and really they're just gluing things together. Some of them are their own like massive platforms. Some of them are just abstractions on top of open source. But we had this error of code names now. In both errors, we have this soup of infrastructure we decided to build ourselves. And at the time, for most of these things, it was a really great idea to build it ourselves because we were ahead of the market. And when I be mind the market in this case is open source or vendor software, basically it's the build versus buy question. And we couldn't buy. We couldn't buy. We couldn't borrow. 
And so we built it ourselves. And that was because at the time we thought, you know, open source or the industry couldn't provide. But it does eventually. Anytime we're working outside of our core competency, the market will provide as long as we're willing to see the problem in the same way that the market saw it. And sometimes that's the challenge. Because sometimes we look at what the market provides and it's only 70% of what we need. So the question is, when, if the market does provide, or when it does eventually provide in the cases where we're ahead of the market, how good are we at migrating? And most of the people in the room know we're not that good, at least when compared with other co technical companies. They move very quickly. They evolve their architectures fast. And we have some excuses. And you may be reacting to the fact that I said there's some excuses. They are excuses. A very good excuse is migra migration is hard. It's extremely hard if you don't have end-to-end -end automated testing, because how do you know what you built now works the same way as what you built before? So this is actually a relatively good excuse sometimes. But we have other excuses, things like, well, this thing we built, we have control of it. We can steer it. Well, guess what? You can contribute to open source, or you can get a good um, relationship with a vendor, and you can steer that too. Sometimes it's that 70% problem. It only meets 70% of our needs, and we have this other 30%. Again, we can build frameworks on top of open source. We can open source those frameworks, or we can contribute back to the open source project that needed a new capability. But I think sometimes we don't think this way because we become very attached to our work, and there's a little bit of the IKEA effect going on in how we approach these technical challenges. So here again, your brain will trick you. Um, and that's hard, but we live in a society in a time whenever there's more information than we can rationally take in and deal with. And so it's a lot easier to just move forward with what we know or what we think we know. And so we have all of our categories, we have all of the things that we believe about the world around us, and we believe that we are perfectly rational. And everyone believes that they are perfectly rational. And so when this happens, when someone says that they're not sure that they agree with you, you probably react this way. <laughs> no, you're an idiot. You just don't know what you're talking about. Clearly, I know everything. Because we all believe that we are the most correct person in the room and that we are always making the best decisions because we have the best information and we have taken all of the information available to us and created a framework about understanding the world. And we feel that way even when we're angry or even when we're upset that someone has done something or even when we're confused about something. Sometimes that's the worst. We're, we may not have all the information and we may know that, but we still come out fighting. And so the best way to address all of those issues is through mindfulness because you need to take a step back and understand your own thoughts because your emotional state and your brain chemistry and sometimes things as simple as whether or not you've eaten today, I have that problem, and <laughs> whether or not you got enough sleep last night actually impacts how you react in situations. Um, it's the empathy gap. The way that you respond to things is actually dependent on your state of mind and the state of your brain at the time. Even though you believe fully, and I am sure that you are, a completely rational person otherwise. So mindfulness allows you to take a step back and think about your thoughts. And it's sort of a, almost a meditative exercise. Don't run off and try to solve the problem or think about a different way of addressing the problem. Instead, think about what you're thinking. Don't judge it, just think, what are my thoughts? Where are they coming from? And if you've been through Accelerate and Drive, you might have heard Practice the Pause which Jim and Todd actually stole from Buddhist meditation. It's not their own thing. Don't let them trick you. But if you take a step back and think about something uh, for even as little as six seconds, it will actually help you respond better in the situation. The hard thing is that you actually have to practice that outside of these incredibly emotionally charged situations because if you wait until you're angry about something to try to take a step back from the situation, you, you will probably fail. So smaller stakes, other situations where maybe you're not angry about something, but you know that you should take a step back and reassess what you're thinking, that's when you practice this. And that works with your kids, too. Have them practice taking a pause when they're, when they're not having the meltdown. So back to that thing you built. Uh, 
after you've taken that pause or you've been mindful and you're ready to consider whether or not this is something we should continue to use or something we should build, I'm gonna recommend the Ryan Brush litmus test. He talked about me in his talk, it's like reciprocal. So basically, ask yourself, if I open source this, would it gain adoption in the industry? And if not, why? Now, some of the answers you're gonna come up with is it's not good enough. If it's not good enough, why are we running it in production? Production is a higher bar than open source. Get that in your mind. Production is a higher bar than open source. If it's because you didn't build it in a way that allowed it to be generalizable, well, that's a different problem. That's a design flaw. If it's because there's something already in the open source industry that's close enough and everybody's already using that, why did you build anything? You should have contributed to open source. And so the idea is if you ask this question and the answer is no, nobody would adopt it, then what are we doing? And ask yourself that. But you have to be calm and mindful first. Our last story is an interesting one. Um, there's this new research coming out that we've read recently that really doesn't have a name yet that we could see. So for now, we're just calling it immoral equals risky. And to, do, to illustrate that one, I'm going to tell a story about an incident. So there was an incident at some point in the day that uh, was, was really concerning in the platform. And the engineer doing the investigation, responsible for the in investigation, needed to be somewhere else for some activity. In this case, we'll say it's a run. And they were trying to figure out, like, how do I give up this thing that's really important to me, my fitness, my health, and also still be responsible for what's going on in the system? And they came up with this genius idea of how they could do both, the power of the and. And they thought, okay, if I can just go run something real quick and then run off and do the thing I was going to do, it's going to take a while anyway, and I can come back and everything will be fixed when I got back. And that's a little bit of over-optimism there. And so I can run while it runs. Well, what happened is they went for the run, they came back, the thing ran, and nothing got better. And so there was this frustration between the manager and the engineer around the irresponsibility of leaving in the middle of an incident. So the question is, what was the real system risk of them walking away from their desk? Had they sat at their desk and watched the script run, but still waited the full time before taking another action, would that still been the same level of risk? If we go back in time and we say, okay, the reason why they left their desk was not because they were going for something like a run or maybe meeting a friend for a happy hour, but instead was they had to go pick up their kid because the daycare was closing, or maybe their kid was sick and they had to take their kid to the hospital, would the reaction and perception have been different? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. So this was a fun ranty moment in my life whenever Michelle sent me this study because it's one of those things that drives me crazy. So even though we know that if you leave a child in the car for five minutes for any reason, the outcomes are going to be the same, if th this study actually found that mothers who left their kids in the car for any period of time to go to work or go to a bar or go on a date versus going to get some medicine, going to the doctor, or mom had a problem outside of the car, is injured and can't get back to the kid. If it's the same duration in either column, people still think the safe reasons lead to better outcomes. So leaving your kid in the car for an hour because you had to go get medicine somehow is less risky to your child than leaving your kid in the car for an hour because you went on a date. And there's a part of that that fits in our brains because, again, we've moralized these things. We've decided one of them is okay, one of them is necessary, and the other one isn't. It's bad. But really and truly, the outcome is the same. They are independent of intent. But what our brains do is they think about, I can empathize with this situation. Sometimes I've got my kids and I have to go to get something done, and there's just nothing I can do about it. But someone went on a date. That's just selfish. So has anybody read This is Water by David Foster Wallace? I can sort of see things, yeah, it's a couple people. Um, so it's actually a really interesting um, commencement address that David Foster Wallace uh, delivered. And the story is, starts out with um, these young fish swimming by and this old fish swims by and says, how's the water? And the young fish say, what's water? And the point is that they are so accustomed to living in their environment and in the structures that they've built that they don't even understand that they are there anymore. 
And so David Foster Wallace's point throughout the story is take yourself outside of your environment and your situation, rise above the story, separate yourself from the narrative and the context that you've created around it so that you can see things differently. Because again, we're going back to this, we all think that we are making the best decisions, even when people don't think we are, and we still get angry, but don't do about that. Try to go back and give them credit for what they know and what they do and the differences in their experience. Because I am still me and I still know what I know and you are still you and you still know what you know. And so a really good way just to get around all of these things is to have a friend or someone who will be really honest with you and call you out when you are being biased. And you have to make sure that you are willing to accept their feedback because you don't want to forget the backfire effects. Now, uh, I love structure when we're dealing with bias, and so Brandy recommend that I do this exercise called the Johari window to figure out some of my own biases. And this is a really interesting exercise because it's about your own story and how you see yourself. So how it works is you get 22 words, and these are attributes, positive attributes about a person, or sometimes more neutral ones like shy. And you give this to people who know you, and then they select a sum number, for me I did six, of attributes that they feel represent you. Of all the ones on the list, these are the ones that represent you. And then you do it yourself without seeing their results. And then when you're done, you map it onto this grid. And this is my results. So basically one quadrant is the known to others, known to self quadrant, which is the things that people and I both agreed on. And I felt good to know that for most of the things we said, we all agreed. Then there's the things that uh, others said about me that I didn't say about myself. And those are the things that were surprising to me that that's how I was perceived. And then in one of the quadrants is the not known to others, but known to me, which is something I believe to be true about myself, but no one else felt that that was as important about me as I did, and that was the self-assertive attribute. And then there were things we generally agreed on were not true of me. I am not patient, I am not shy, and I am not modest. So what's interesting to me is actually in the not known to self, but known to others was knowledgeable. And I really reacted when I saw that one come across, and that came up from other people more than anything else. Everyone else said I was knowledgeable, and I didn't think that about myself. And what I realized is that because of the cult of knowing thing that Brandy and I have, that shared terminology about how people who hoard knowledge and how it bothers us, I really did not like the idea of people perceiving me as knowledgeable because I immediately reacted to that. I was like, oh, am I hoarding knowledge? Am I part of the cult of knowing? And so that's why I couldn't see it myself. Now this is a pretty harmless exercise um, where you know, we take the structure and we kind of figure out who we are. There's also a no-hari method where you take all bad words and you do the same exercise. I wasn't willing to put that on a big screen. But generally speaking, one of the things I truly believe is structure beats bias. And the Johari window or the no-hari window is just a way to get some understanding of your own bias. But there's other ways as well, and we talked about that with the mindfulness and the, and the uh, taking a pause. Now, when we started with this talk, we really expected we were going to do a survey of a ton of different biases. And we went through and we listed, I don't want to say 30 different biases that we were really excited to talk about. But then as we started writing together, we realized that the, the talk was gonna go in a fundamentally different direction. And we didn't expect that we'd have this talk that we were basically saying the same thing as Michael Lopp yesterday morning about being unfailingly kind and having empathy and that we were gonna talk about David Foster Wallace, but that's where it landed. So with that, I have my last three disclaimers, which is we didn't cover nearly enough ways you can be biased, and there's tons of resources out there in tons of different ways that impact us all the time. And we didn't cover nearly enough tools to fight it, because again, depending on the bias, there may be different tools, depending on who you are, different things might work for you. But to make up for the fact that we went in a completely different direction than we started out with, uh, we have handouts. Um, that's because Brandy used to be a teacher. And <laughs> so... Uh, I can't not do it. If you, yeah, if you find Ryan Brush or me today, uh, mostly probably me, but right now Ryan Brush, because I'm on stage, uh, we have example Jahari windows if you'd like to try it yourself that you can take and photocopy and give your friends and, have, and see what it comes out. Um, and also, just in case uh, you wanted to read up on more bias, we actually did um, create a whole bunch of Google Docs that have like, a bunch of links to some of the studies we talked about, to pages that explain more biases, and even like simple cheat sheets on how to evaluate your own bias. So again, um, thank you, Brandy, for, for having, bringing your teacher to the presentation. <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>